So thank you very much uh, uh, to Massimo Vergasola who accepted our invitation to uh, give a plenary colloquium of SIFS uh, in this occasion. This is the first plenary colloquium of 2022. It's really a honor to have uh, Massimo as a speaker uh, in this occasion. And uh, I want just to recall all of you, although I know that Massimo is known by most of you people attending the seminar, that Massimo is uh, nowadays professor at the Ecole Normale in Paris and is director of the Quantitative Biology uh, Lab of CNRS in France. Uh, Massimo studied in Italy and uh, then he spent a great deal of his car scientific career in France, but not only, he was visiting several important institutions, scientific institutions all over the world. And uh, he started his activity in the statistical mechanics of uh, fluids, essentially, and uh, then he moved uh, to bio biophysics in a wide sense. And uh, since uh, some decades, he has become uh, certainly one of the most renowned authorities in this field in the world. So it's really a great honor to have him here this afternoon and uh, thank you again and uh, please it's your time for this very interesting seminar which concerns a very interesting topic which summarizes complexity in biological systems and though what is certainly referred to the physical aspects concerned to this problem thank you massimo thanks roberto thank you it's a real pleasure to give this talk. Um, I was very pleased when I received your invitation by yourself and Rafael a few few weeks ago. Um, and I'll be um, I'll be making so I, I was of course confronted with the with the problem whether I should give a talk in uh, uh, on one specific thing or or give an overview. And finally, I decided to give an overview. So I'll 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 go over a few things. And of course, your uh, you're most welcome to stop us for more details or at the end I'll be happy to discuss details about everything. The sense will be to, 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 to give an overview of the different uh, problems on which uh, I was uh, curious, I got uh, interested along the way. And in particular, I'll be discussing three, uh, uh, three phenomena, natural phenomena, all of them have to do with uh, with real uh, life and behavior of animals. Um, all of them have to do with navigation, so that's the common theme in, in all of them, but they have quite quite different uh, things. And you will see that the fluid dynamics that uh, uh, I grew up with uh, turns out, in fact, to be quite uh, quite important and quite relevant, but there's, 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 there's many aspects of biology that need to be uh, integrated. The first problem that I'll be discussing is the long distance uh, searches uh, by olfaction. Uh, this is mostly done, but not only by insects. Then I'll be discussing some other work on uh, soaring flight um, that is done by all sorts of migratory birds or eagles in this particular picture here. And then I'll be discussing the uh, tracking of trails. Now we go to the ground. Up to now, we've been flying. Uh, all this has been the first two are about flying. The third one is about staying on the ground. And they can be uh, they can be ants, they can be rats, they can be dogs. Uh, how you should uh, track a trail uh, of odors on the on the ground. And as I said, I'll be talking about all this trying to show you why uh, and how a physicist can contribute uh, to this uh, to this problem. And more recently, uh, why machine learning tools and in particular reinforcement learning uh, turns out to be relevant and how it can be brought to bear on this on these problems. And um, I'll, I'll end up with uh, with uh, stuff that we've been doing recently and some open problems. So that's the plan. And let me get started with what the problems are. Um, First of all, the olfactory searches. So the phenomenon is very is very simple to explain. Um, uh, you um, you take a moth in this particular case, and you can recognize that this is a male moth because of the antennae that you see uh, uh, that you see up up here. These antennae are covered by receptors for uh, pheromones. 
And these pheromones are emitted by female moths that typically this, this is a source of pheromones is, is an acronym for, for female moths that typically are sitting on a, on a tree. Of course, in the experiments, what you do is that you take a, a bottle of pheromones and you, and you, let, them, you let them go. And the typical phenomenon that happens uh, in nature is that the males are flying uh, all, over, uh, all over the place. And at a certain point, they detect some of these pheromones, which are uh, emitted at relatively low concentration on the order of a few picograms per, per second. And um, the only point of saying that it's a few hundred Daltons is to say that these pheromones, they get transported by the wind. They don't sink to the ground immediately. They fly over transported by the wind. So they stay up in the air. And uh, the, the, male, uh, the male moths, they can detect this, uh, these pheromones at distances, as you can see from the bar, which is here, that can be tens or even hundreds of meters away. And once they detect, they, uh, they get into a pretty stereotype uh, trajectory of motion, which is represented here from a beautiful paper of 83 in, by David et al, uh, where they, uh, they reported the trajectories of this, uh, of this male moths, a few of them. And as you can see, we are tens of meters away from the source. The concentration is relatively low. And as you will see, the farther problem is that these uh, pheromones are transported by a turbulent flow and therefore their concentration is very stochastic and very noisy. But in spite of this, what happens is that these uh, males, once they detect the pheromones, they start moving upwind in, a in, pa in parts of the trajectories which are called zigzag when they move consistently upwind. The, the arrows here are the direction of the, of the local direction of the wind. And as you can see, they move upwind, then probably in this here, they've lost the track, they haven't detected for a while. So they get into a, a, another program of flight, which is called casting. I mean, this is very sketchy, by has been done by, by biologists and entomologists, but you see the idea. The idea is that they alternate between going straight up wind and then cutting the wind in a, with an angle which is uh, substantial, which is important. Like here, for example, they're essentially perpendicular to the wind. And somehow by alternating these two trajectories and controlling this casting, the alternation between zag zigzagging and casting, they managed to get to the, to the source of pheromones uh, in time scales of the order of a few minutes. And of course, I don't need to tell you, since we're talking about pheromones and mating, that this is particularly important from the point of view of evolution, because that's the way they, uh, that's the way they reproduce. And the idea is that to, it's not understood how they managed to do it. There's casting and zigzagging, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is more or less arbitrary, but, uh, well, arbitrary, it's, it's defined in a relatively sketchy way as, as you've seen, but the, the, the main problem is to understand how uh, these moths, they manage to control their casting and their zigzagging to alternate between the two as a function of the detections that they have. And this problem from the point of view, both computational and the point of view of the strategy of flight is not, is not understood. Um, the second problem is the trail tracking. Uh, and as I said, now we go we go to the ground and there's a number of animals that manage to do this. Uh, uh, this is the example of the ants. There's a, there's a set of experiments which has been done recently. Um, then there are rats. Uh, here the experiments have been done on a treadmill where you lay a, um, a trail. You can draw a trail uh, on the treadmill and then you have the animal which runs along this treadmill and makes this, this kind of trajectories that, as you can see, they, they, they go this wheel around, around the, the trajectory, which is in blue. The red is the trajectory of the, of the mouse uh, here. And, um, and you can see that, that the animal is capable of, of staying along the trail. Sometimes it loses, especially when there's a big curvature, like in this case here, the, it's losing the trail. But the most important thing is, in fact, when the trail is broken, when the trail is broken, you see that the, the animal starts to do this widening uh, casts. So it starts to alternate as if it were looking for, for the trail which has got lost. And this, this, this oscillations, this, uh, this, this moving uh, back and forth around the hypothetical, the hypothetical trail, which, which is here, it's the, the understanding again of how this is getting 
in control at the neurobiological level is, uh, is an open problem. And uh, here I've just reported, even though the experiments are not, uh, are not done on humans, most of the experiments are done, as I said, on dogs or uh, rodents or ants. But even humans, you will be happy to know that, in fact, it's usually said that the olfaction in, in humans is pretty bad, and it is pretty bad compared to rodents. But if we get trained sufficiently, as has been done in this uh, in this experiment since 2007, in fact, we, we are able to follow a trail of odors at speeds which are which are relatively slow, centimeters per second. We are not particularly uh, uh, as good as the rats, but we are able to we are able to follow to follow a trail. Um, and of course, it's not clear whether these animals are following the same strategy. Most likely, yes, but but it's it's an open it's an open issue. Um, and then I get to the thermal soaring uh, to the soaring uh, problem. The, here, uh, you're probably familiar with the with the soaring of birds. You've probably seen eagles or other animals that that fly without flapping their wings, and. Uh, I want to show you one uh, one uh, GPS uh, recording of um, of a falcon which is flying uh, along the, uh, on this plane here, and you will see that at a certain point the uh, the, the falcon picks up here. It's going to start to spiral. And while it's spiraling, even though you cannot see, it's gaining height and it's going uh, up. So all these spirals are uh, at the same time as it is spiraling, it's also gaining height. And most likely, even though this is not reported in the paper, but, but uh, most likely what is happening is that the, the, the animal, the, 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 the bird is picking up an ascending current, which is uh, uh, which probably is due to, 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 to the thermal. Uh, it's a thermal uh, meaning that it's due to the, to the heating of the, of the ground. There's an ascending current and it's using this ascending current in order to gain height. And the advantage for uh, predatory birds like, uh, like a falcon or like the eagles is that they can gain a point of view uh, very high. And from this point of view, then they can, they can try and catch their, their prey. And of course, the advantage is that they don't have to flap their wings. So uh, they have an advantage, an energetic advantage in, in, in doing this. Um, now, I've talked about predatory birds, but in fact, this is extremely common in, uh, in the migration of birds. Uh, pretty much all migratory birds are, uh, are able to, to use ascending currents and to do soaring. And this is reported in this book on migration ecology that the routes, the typical migratory routes that you have reported in this, in this picture here, they're pretty dense when you go and you measure the, the, the presence of, of thermals of ascending currents along this migration migratory routes, they're particularly dense in this, uh, in, in the presence of ascending currents. And one can make estimates of, um, uh, of the advantage of the metabolic energetic advantage that they have, these migratory birds. And one can estimate that in order to cover thousands of kilometers, like in the case of migratory birds, uh, the fact of not flapping the wings and using this ascending currents brings an advantage which corresponds to, the, to, to, to an amount of fat which is of the order of half the weight of the bird. In other words, if the, if the birds couldn't use these ascending currents, they would have to, uh, to, to store an amount of fat which is half of their weight, which obviously is going to be, it would be very detrimental. So once again, it's very important for the, from the evolutionary point of view. Uh, this is another example where they've looked at uh, frigate birds. In this case, since they're flying over the sea, uh, probably uh, the origin of the ascending currents is not due to dermals, it's due to some atmospheric different phenomenon. But once again, what you can see is that the, the, the birds, they, they move up and down. At the same time, their cardiac frequency is reported, so they can monitor when they're flapping the wings. And as you can see, there's this pretty vertiginous uh, ascension of the, of, the, of the bird 
at an at the height which is of the order of two kilometers and then it's gonna it's gonna go down here without flapping the wings so again the advantage is that it's gonna gain height in this case and then it's gonna it's gonna glide without flapping the wings and in this way the uh, there's there's a big amount of energy which is which is stored um, now this is not a new phenomenon by no, no means and since I'm talking to uh, to the Italian Society of Physics, I can just show this, uh, and you all recognize that this is uh, this is Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was actually drawing the uh, the, the the while it was at the Vatican, probably uh, overlooking from the Vatican. He was he was making this kind of drawing, which are extremely beautiful because you, he captured pretty much all the phenomena. And as you see, the spiral, which is a little bit too regular, but still. Uh, it's it's quite similar to what you've seen in this uh, in this movie here, and then you see the gliding from one thermal to another thermal, and then it's going to lose height and it's going to pick another height here, and all this is reported and all this drawing are discussed in this uh, in this nice paper of 2018 where this drawing have been have been discussed. Now, so far I've been talking about uh, birds or about animals, but uh, in addition to the interest in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, for animals and for biology, for neurobiology uh, and for behavior, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of interest in technological applications for both problems. Um, uh, technological application, they go from unmanned aerial vehicles in the case of soaring. So in this case, you have uh, you have drones, you have uh, uh, planes that can have an engine. But in general, the big problem in having a, 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 a plane with an engine is that the batteries are relatively limited. And therefore, if you want to keep the, the planes up in the air for very long times, you run into the problem of not having enough battery. Therefore, if you want to do some surveillance, some delivery, some monitoring, uh, and of course, I'm not talking here about military applications because I'm not my favorite ones, but, but there are, of course, military applications. Uh, the big problem that one has to face is the, uh, is the uh, uh, autonomy and the limited amount of battery that they can have. And therefore, it would be very useful to have good strategies of flight where you recognize the presence of some thermals and like the birds that I've shown you before, you go up and then you glide and you pick another one. And this way, while you're doing these operations, you can switch off the battery. You don't need to have the engine on and therefore you can extend substantially the, uh, the autonomy of the flight. In the case of the olfactory, uh, olfaction is, uh, can be flying or can be on the ground. In both cases, there are, uh, there are uh, the so-called sniffers, uh, which is, by the way, the way I started uh, now uh, almost 15 years ago by this, this paper on a strategy of search in photaxis based on information theory, uh, uh, applied to olfactory robots with applications that can go to chemical leaks, to drugs, bombs, uh, mines, uh, sources of toxic substances. The idea being that you have a source of some substances somewhere and rather than going human or training animals, you could uh, have a olfactory robot like here equipped with some electronic noses and equipped with the possibility of moving around and you go to the sources of this of these chemicals without involving uh, animals or without uh, 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 human intervention. Um, this strategy that I was talking is actually pretty, pretty. Uh, Infotaxis has been applied to robots with with good success. So I would say that that uh, for technological applications we are in a relatively good shape, provided you give us uh, some of, uh, some res some receptors, some electronic noses, which is still an open problem. But given proper electronic noses, the strategy is 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 pretty pretty good at dealing with situations at tens of meters uh, away. Um, so here, let me just start by, uh, I've shown you the three phenomena. Now I would like to uh, tell you a little bit why uh, a physics a physicist should, should get involved and might get involved and why it's interesting at least 
for myself or my experience to get involved in this kind of problems. Now, there's several, uh, uh, there's several uh, layers and there's several aspects where physics matters. And of course, first of all, is the, is the fact that all these animals are moving. And whenever they move, they have to face the, the constraints imposed by physics. In particular, for example, if you take the flight, I've sketched the flight here with the usual constraint that come to any uh, flying object, like could be a bird or could be a plane. The fact that you have the lift, you have the drag, you have the weight, and you have to compensate all these forces in order to have a thrust and to, and to fly. And in this respect, an important quantity is the so-called uh, glide polar, which is going to give you how much you gain in horizontal uh, speed if you lose a certain amount of, uh, of, uh, of height. So the idea of, of, uh, of soaring is that if you lose, you convert the potential energy of your height, you lose, you go down, but at the same time you use this quantity to, to this form of energy to glide and you convert the potential energy that you lose by, uh, by sinking into kinetic energy that you use in order, in order to fly it. And that's the idea how you can save, how you can save energy. Um, now, this is one aspect, but it's probably not, at least it's, it's very important and it's very interesting, but it's not the most uh, original one or the one that I've been mostly involved. So I would like to talk, you about, uh, to talk with you about uh, a different aspects that have to do in particular with the environment where the animals have, uh, are confronted with. And so talking about uh, uh, soaring and thermal soaring, um, one aspect which is related, of course, to fluid dynamics is how you generate these ascending currents, how they're spaced, and what is their statistics. So let me just give you the 101 of how this, uh, these ascending currents are generated. In the case of thermals, the, as the name says, it's generated by the heating of the, of the ground by the sun. And once you hit the ground, then the difference in, in temperature and the difference in density between the, the different layers is going to generate an ascending current by uh, baroclinic effects, which means that the, uh, the, um, the, the, the equation of state is, is going to start to depend on temperature as well. This typically generates some vorticity, and this vorticity is going to bring up uh, the air and it's going to generate this these ascending currents. Now you'll not be surprised. Uh, this is a lighter uh, curve showing uh, in on the y-axis you have the height, on the x-axis you have the hour of the day, and then the color plot is giving you in uh, in uh, uh, blue or uh, green is when the velocity is very low and in red is when the velocity, the vertical velocity in the vertical direction up is very, uh, is very high. And as you can tell, um, clearly at early hours of the day or late hours of the day, there's not much heating and therefore uh, there's not much ascending currents. But during the good uh, hours of the day when there's, sufficiently, uh, there's sufficient heating, you can see that there's uh, these currents, they can be several meters per second. And um, they can bring you up at height, which are of the order comparable to what you've seen before with the frigate birds. You can get easily to, to heights which are of the order of one kilometers and a half, two kilometers. Um, but you will also you also see in this plot that uh, moving in this current is not like taking an elevator. These are these ascending currents are generated by turbulence, and therefore they last for relatively short times they can uh, they can disappear uh, rather abruptly and also what you can see is that nearby ascending currents you can actually have descending currents because this is an incompressible fluid and therefore if there's some stuff which is going up there's going to be some stuff which is coming down so you better be careful when you start flying in these ascending currents that you don't pick the descending current but you pick the ascending one and this is this moves because because of course it's turbulence and therefore the flying is not as obvious as it might look look from the from the drawings or the, the naive ideas that that one might have uh, on this ascending currents. They're pretty noisy. They're pretty uh, stochastic and therefore flying inside is not obvious. 
Now, um, so how did we cope with this? Well, we, we in the, in the uh, when we started working on the soaring problem, first of all, what we did were some simulations because at the time I uh, was not particularly familiar with machine learning tools. I was, I confess, I, I was actually pretty skeptical. So before in, uh, embarking into experiments, what we did was to use some some simulations and some simulations. Uh, unfortunately, one cannot simulate. Uh, uh, one cannot simulate the, the whole uh, the whole flow directly of the atmospheric boundary layer. The atmospheric boundary layer can actually be simulated in uh, large eddy simulations, but large eddy simulations, what they do is that they truncate the resolution of the field at the given distance. And with the current resolution that we have, the, the distance is of the order of 50 meters. Uh, this, by the way, it's a simulation which has been done at Argonne, and you can see the ascending currents in uh, in uh, in red and the descending currents in 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 blue. Um, the problem with having a resolution of 50 meters is that um, the typical distance that the, the 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 typical velocity that the birds move is of the order of meters per second, and they make decisions uh, roughly estimated of the order of seconds. Therefore, the distance over which they make their decision, or over which they sample the, 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 the mechanosensory cues on which they probably base their decision, is going to be of the order of a few meters. Therefore, you would like to resolve the, uh, the flow on distances of meters and not 50 meters, because otherwise you're throwing uh, the, the, the everything, uh, everything and you're not really resolving. Therefore, when we started working on the soaring problem, as I said, we, we started with simulations and we used a uh, different uh, fluid dynamic problem, which is the rayleigh benard convection. The rayleigh benard convection is what is the experiment that you do every time you are uh, you're cooking pasta. So what you do is that you have some heating, uh, uh, some heating down and then you can possibly cool or leave it at, uh, at room temperature, the upper part. And if you raise enough uh, the uh, Rayleigh number, which is the 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 the, 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 um, the equivalent of the uh, of the Navi uh, of the of the Reynolds number for Navier-Stokes dynamics. Uh, if you raise enough the Rayleigh number, then there's going to be instabilities, and this instability will create this this current ascending. And again, there will be ascending currents and descending currents. Now, of course, Rayleigh Bernard convection is not the atmospheric boundary layer, but it it embodies all the all the elements of the of the problem meaning there's there's a flow which is turbulent which is hardly predictable and what you can do then is to put a an agent as i will discuss momentarily into this kind of flows and see how they can they can move and what they can learn about exploiting this this these flows in order to gain height but before we get there, I'm going to get there in a, in, a, in a few minutes. But before we get there, I want to continue on the uh, applications of physics, why physics is relevant for this kind of problems. And therefore, I would like to discuss the, uh, the, 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 the relevance of physics for the, for, the, for the statistics of odor detections, and in particular for the case where uh, they are transported by the wind. Now, this audience uh, is, uh, uh, is familiar with uh, with uh, uh, turbulence therefore uh, i will not spend a long time trying to convince you that that turbulence generates fields which are quite different from the diffusive ones the diffusive ones are smooth regular uh, but relatively slow turbulence uh, conversely what it does is that it transports stuff at velocities which are meters per second that's the typical speed therefore the, the stuff, the information, as in the case of the female moths, they're trying to communicate their presence to the male moths. And if they were to do this by diffusion, well, they would never mate because the, the, the time that it would take to communicate over tens of meters would be uh, so astronomically long that, that they could not. Uh, therefore, turbulence has the advantage of conveying the message over long distances in a, in a short time, so it's fast. 
But at the same time, it's very noisy. As you can see from these plots here, this is a jet flow. You have a jet which is uh, uh, um, creating a, a flow, as you can see in this cone here. And then what you do is that you inject some scalar uh, field, which can be fluorescent or can be any other tracer that, that, that uh, it's advantageous to use in the, it's handy to use in the experiments. And as you can see, even at distances of the order of 50 centimeters, because that's what we're talking here, 50 centimeters, this is what you get. You get an extremely noisy and complicated flow. And at 50 centimeters, it's still possible if you wait sufficiently long to, uh, to smooth out the signal, waiting a little bit, and then extract some information about the, uh, the gradients and the extract some information how to get to the source. The problem is that as you move out, you move downwind, as soon as you reach distances of the order of a few meters, then uh, the time that you should be waiting in order to smooth your flow and extract the gradients becomes again uh, extremely long of the order of hours. And as I've shown you before, uh, the moths don't wait for, for hours. It's not convenient to wait for hours. And they do this in a very different way, exploiting and relying on the, on the fluctuations. Therefore, the problem is not just to smooth out uh, as, for example, in environmental studies. The problem is to cope with these fluctuations and somehow to use them. And um, so if you go uh, at distances which are relevant for the flight of the moths or for the technological applications that you would like to have, because having a robot finding a source at 50 centimeters, as you can guess, is not really technologically important. Um, but if you start to go at 50 meters, like in this case, what the kind of profiles that you see are these ones. So imagining that this is uh, you have a threshold of detection somewhere. Uh, what you would see is that from time to time there's a, there are spikes, there are whiffs where you detect uh, uh, something. But then most of the time you're just blank. You don't see anything. Uh, the uh, detections, there's no detection. You're you're kind of flying in a desert. And somehow you have to integrate the past information on the detections that you have. And somehow this is what is going on while the moths are, are doing their uh, zigzagging and casting. Uh, most likely what they're doing is that somehow they're storing some, uh, some information on the previous detections or the time of the previous detections. And then they're using this information on detections that are obviously sporadic, as you can tell from this plot here, uh, into a strategy of flight some, somehow. And of course, one problem which is, which is uh, quite relevant is to understand uh, uh, the statistics of this of these spikes that you have, and here we could use together with Antonio Celani and Emmanuel Villarmo in uh, Marseille, uh, we could use some uh, some tools of of fluid dynamics, and in particular, what you can do is that you can map the problem of the uh, of this signal here. Uh, you might remember the passive scalar equation is a scalar which is getting transported by the flow, and therefore the, uh, uh, the concentration of the scalar is conserved along trajectories. So if I want to know what's the concentration at the detection point, which is here, what I should do is that I should be tracing the trajectory back in time, and I should be looking, uh, going backward in time, whether it overlaps with the source. If it overlaps with the source, then it's charging the injection. So the female is pumping the, uh, the, the pheromones. And therefore, if the puff is going, is, is going through the source, then I'm going to detect something at this location. Now, when I release my puff, if the puff is very broadens a lot, what is going to happen is that most of the puff will not overlay, will not overlap with the source, and therefore there will be just a tiny bit of concentration. So this is the typical case where the concentration is relatively weak. When the puff is does overlap with the with the source, going backward in time, but it's too broad in order to charge a lot. The situation where you do have the spikes is the situation where the path going backward in time is overlapping with the source, but at the same time, it, it's staying relatively small. So you have a path which overlaps with the source and at the same time is staying small. These are rare events that you can calculate. 
And then in the case where the, the path going backward in time doesn't overlap at all, then in that case, this is zero concentration, the cases that you've seen before where you don't see anything. So if you, if you plot this in terms of time, concentration as a function of time, you see these different possibilities. This is zero because you don't overlap. This is the case where the path is small and overlapping, so you get a relatively high spike. Then here it's a concentration which is relatively low, which is in the, in the average, again, zero. And here there's a big spike because it's small and overlapping and so on. So what I'm telling you is that this problem, which looks, uh, which looks quite difficult, and it is quite difficult, can be converted into a residence uh, time problem. So the question is converted, knowing when there are spikes or not spikes, is converted into a problem of if I release a path here, does it overlap with the source and for how long is going to overlap with the source? Now, um, once the problem is converted into a residence time problem, it's still quite complicated because these paths that I've drawn here as nice and smooth and regular, in fact, in reality, the way they look is more like this. So it's plenty of folds, they're very complicated, they're very corrugated, and therefore if you want to follow one of these paths really in detail, this is, this is a daunting task that nobody is able to do. But in our case, what we are we are trying to do is that we are not uh, 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 the source. In fact, here, typical source is of the order of centimeters because the female moths are uh, of that size. And therefore, we are not really interested into the small folds of the in, of the order of millimeters or submillimeter scale, because anyway, when the when the, the, the path is getting swept by the wind, anyway, this these scales are not very important. In other words, what I'm telling you is that we can prob we can likely integrate over these uh, small scales and just look at the path a little bit like I've drawn here. So to smooth out this, uh, this internal degrees of freedom and just look at the shape and the size of the path and the position of the path as a function of time. And this is what we've done in this paper here. You can look up the details. There's also a synopsis where there's, uh, there's, uh, it's, in, it's introduced and it's explained uh, uh, more pedagogically what's been done. But the idea is what I've told you. It's converted into a residence time and then you look at the evolution of these paths as a function of time. And when these paths, they start moving, the question is uh, how they move here. And in, uh, <clears throat> in the limit, in a particular limit, what you can you, you can see is once the the source once it overlaps with the source, then you can look for relatively uh, sh uh, long times. Here it's going to do a diffusive motion, so it's going to it's going to dance around here because of the effect of the turbulent flow at small scales, and therefore here there's going to be a sort of diffusion at least for uh, uh, for some times, not too long. There's going to be some some diffusion. And now all of you are familiar with the laws of diffusion and you know that if I take a diffusive process and I ask how long it's going to stay on one side or how long it's going to it's going to uh, stay on one side of the axis so how long is staying on the positive side this obeys the law of t to the minus three half and therefore what you see appearing in this uh, in this uh, in this problem is the diffusive law t to the minus three half Therefore, if you ask what's the time that the whiffs, so this long, this strong detections, they last, the prediction that, that we made in the paper is that this, they should last for, with a very broad distribution, which corresponds to what you've seen in the, in the, in the data, and this should go like t to the minus three half, and you can go and revisit the data that were available, and this is exactly what you see in the data. These are jet flows at distances of the order of tens of centimeters. And you can also go in the atmospheric boundary layers where the finite size effect are, are even less because here we are at the distances of the order of 60 or 200 or 300 meters. And again, what you see is that there's a, there's a beautiful T to the minus three half law which appears here, which says that uh, what you've seen before, that these waves, they last for times that can go from the order of milliseconds to time of the order that can be uh, seconds or tens of seconds. The counterpart, of course, is that if you ask how long the blanks are going to last, 
Well, the blanks, they can last from milliseconds or tens of uh, hundreds of, uh, uh, um, of hundreds of seconds to these two times, which are of the order of 10 seconds or 100 seconds. So the, the, the crossing of the desert of these birds can actually be pretty long. Um, so let me have given you a sense of why fluid dynamics. Now let me get to machine learning and in particular reinforcement learning. And this is the typical scheme. And this is the book, uh, the Bible of this reinforcement learning, the Sutton and Bartu book, uh, which I recommend. So what's the idea of the reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning was uh, introduced uh, in neurobiology as, as a putative mechanism for, uh, for reinforcement for learning by the animals, but then has taken a, a, its own way and now it's used a lot in, uh, in, uh, in machine learning as a tool to, to uh, train an optimally, quote unquote, you will see why, quote unquote, behaving agent. So what's the scheme? The scheme is that you have a Markov system. So you have states here, S of T. These states I will define momentarily in the case, for example, of soaring what they are. They can take actions like, for example, changing the angles or other things. And then you have a reward. Now, the reward can be, for example, the gain that you hide, uh, that the, the, the height that you gain. And by taking these actions and you convert the, your states, you get into another state, which possibly can include the environment as well. So you go to S of T plus one. Markovianity, of course, means as usual that once you define the state, that's all. You don't remember, you don't need to remember anything any longer than S of T plus one. And you keep doing this. Now, the idea and the, the goal of all this is to maximize the uh, integral of the reward. And typically the uh, integral is discounted because there's a notion that you wanna do things in a, rela in, in a certain time. Therefore, what you want to do is that you want to maximize something like gamma to the T, R of T, the sum over all possible times, where gamma is the discount factor. Now, in order, to, and now you want to train your agent. So you would like to understand, given a certain state of yourself and the environment, what kind of actions I should be taking in order to maximize my uh, integral of the reward, discounted integral of the reward. And the problem in doing this is that if you take, if you may take an action at a given time, this can have an effect in the future, and therefore you have to, uh, you have to reach a balance between being very greedy, for example, moving uh, in trying to, uh, to, to maximize the immediate reward, but at the same time, you, you have to balance this with the fact that you have to uh, foresee what is going to happen in the future, which is giving the problem of, the, uh, uh, of how you train the agent. And in particular, if you have a trajectory which is particularly advantageous, how you track back the good actions that were taken along the way and what actions were responsible for this, uh, for this good uh, result. Now, this is done, all this training is done in, uh, in uh, reinforcement learning and machine learning by the so-called action value uh, formalism, which is the following. The following, the Q is telling you the value, so how much if I am in a state S of T and I take an action A of T at time T, what will be the value, so how much of the integral discounted uh, reward I'm going to get in the future. This is the function Q. And of course, if I knew this, then I could have my policy, optimal policy, because what I would do is that if I'm sitting in a state S, I would take the arg max of this, because this is what ensures the uh, maximum, the, the best possible value. And therefore, this would give me a policy of action. Now, how to learn the function Q? And here starts the troubles. Uh, the function Q uh, obeys a, a, an exact equation, which is the following one. It's a little, uh, at the next time step, you can get the reward R of T plus one. This is a convention that you put T plus one in the reward here. And then once you have this reward, you took an action A of T. So you're going to move to the state S of T plus one. Now, Markovianity says that at this state, I don't need to learn to know anything any longer. So I can just say that this is going to be uh, beta, which is my discount, this factor uh, discounted that counts uh, beta to the T R of T, how much I decline the interest in the in the future, multiplied by the uh, multiplied by the value at the next state, which is here. 
So this is a, a recursive equation that you have, and you would like to use this equation, which a priori is exact, but it's not very useful in this in this form, in order to learn and to learn from experience. And there's a number of, of tools, and there's this can be discussed in, gore, in all these gory details. This is the book of Sutton and Barto that I've shown you before. Uh, it's available online, and in particular, it contains a, a nice discussion on the thermal soaring that I'll be discussing momentarily. Now, let's see at the, the problem of soaring. Let's get concrete and let's see what the state uh, is. So the state is, uh, in the case of the soaring, it's going to be given by the sensory motor cues, in particular whether you, you feel the wind and you, you know that the wind, for example, is blowing at a given speed in a certain direction. These are the sensory motor cues that the animal or the, or the plane can sense. And then, of course, there's the state of the plane itself or the animal itself. For example, it could be the bank angle, meaning the angle that the, the two wings are, are taking, or the angle of attack, which is the angle in this direction here that you that you have of the of the of the plane. And the actions that you can take, of course, you cannot modify the environment, but you can modify your flying angles, the bank angle and the angle of attack. And um, how do you learn? Well, here it's a bit disappointing for physicists to spend their life trying to uh, uh, to use very sophisticated uh, optimization tools. The way uh, this is done in machine learning is relatively, and reinforcement learning is relatively primitive. So this is just the uh, temporal difference scheme, which is what we've been using and most people use, um, is the following. If from this equation here, if you were if you had reached convergence, then what you would have is that the right hand side should be equal to the left hand side. So what you do is that you update the current value of the action value function here. You update it into the old value that you have, plus a learning parameter eta that must be tuned uh, uh, empirically, uh, multiplied by the difference between what you should expect here, the right hand side, minus the left hand side here. And you just keep going this, you just keep doing this as a function of time, you, 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 as a function of the experience, you tune this parameter, typically you can cool it down. And of course, you don't want to be greedy too, uh, too early. Therefore, you, you use a soft policy, which contains a temperature that typically you start very high and then you start cooling. And you use as an energy function, you use the, the, the estimate of the action value that you have here, you're, uh, I'm, I was missing hat. So this is going to be an estimate. There should be a hat everywhere. So this is what we do. Nothing more sophisticated than this. And as I said, we started for soaring into a, this Rayleigh Benar flows. And at the very beginning of the training, this is what you have because the the, the agent is taking uh, random moves, and therefore it sinks like a, like a stone, as you can see. But at the end of about 200 uh, episodes of about five minutes, this is what you get. You, you start in this really Benar flow to, to move, and then you pick up an ascending currents like the ones you've seen before, and you reach heights which are a converted units. They can be several hundreds of meters uh, comparable to what you've seen in the, in the real life. So these are simulations. Let me tell you a little bit more how, what are the states, what are the actions. So the actions, uh, the, the states uh, that the sensory motor cues that the animal most likely is sensing and certainly turn out to be advantageous to sense are the vertical acceleration and the torque. So what is the vertical acceleration? The vertical acceleration is how much the stuff is getting pushed up. So that makes obvious sense. The torque is the following thing, is the difference in velocity between the left uh, and the right uh, wing. And why is this useful? Which essentially tells you how much the body is rotating. Why is this useful? It's useful because imagine that you have a thermal somewhere here at this location. Therefore, if the thermal is closer to the left wing, to the right wing in this case, than to the left wing, what is going to happen is that the vertical velocity is going to be higher on the closer side to the thermal. And therefore, you're going to have a torque which is going to flip your, 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 your plane in this direction here. Therefore, by using the uh, vertical acceleration to tell you when you are in a thermal 
and the torque to tell you on which side you have the uh, the thermal, you have these two very useful mechanical cues that uh, are certainly used by uh, glider pilots because I've been discussing with them quite 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 a long time, and it's an open question whether the birds they do send similar things, and there are ongoing experiments on on trying to figure this out. So these are the the, the cues. Now, what are the state? The state. Um, of the plane is that um, the other news is that we, you don't need to be very, very uh, 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 fine in, uh, in the values of these two mechanical cues, the acceleration and the torque. You can actually discretize them in uh, three big bands. This was the big surprise, positive surprise that we had. We thought we should use some deep learning or complicated things. In practice, at the end, we could discretize and reduce everything to a lookup table. As you can see here, very negative values of the acceleration, very negative value of the torque, or small values of the acceleration, negative values of the torque. So at the end, you have nine possible values of this couple, acceleration and torque. And the control parameter is the bank angle, which we also discretize in angles of the order of five degrees. And so the policy of flight at the end of the day turned out to be very simple and to tell you uh, increase the bank angle like here in red, decrease the bank angle by five degrees or stay with the current uh, bank angle, which is here. So that's the way the, uh, the agent in the simulations was controlled. And of course, the interesting question is to figure out whether this policy, which looks uh, awfully simple, uh, is going to survive the test of the, real, of the real experiments. Therefore, what we did was to take a glider of a two meters wingspan to equip it with uh, detectors of, the, of wind on the two wings and then a control and the processor that does the calculation that uh, the, the lookup table that I've shown you before. I skipped the details of the engineering of all this. And uh, at the time I was uh, I was professor at UCSD. UCSD is, is great for the for the thermal because there's uh, sun pretty much all the time. The desert is uh, not far. If you drive east uh, by a few tens of kilometers, you can get in uh, in places where the heating on the ground is certainly not missing. And here there's Jerome who's uh, sitting and looking at the plane here, which is flying. And let me show you what uh, happened after uh, we had to retrain, of course, everything because uh, because of course the the Rayleigh Bernard convection is not the atmospheric boundary layer. But after a training of a couple of days, then you can just uh, let the plane go. The plane, you turn off the engine and here's the plane flying without any engine here at this at heights that are comparable with the clouds, as you can see here. And in good days where the heating is, is, is sufficiently strong, uh, the plane can stay uh, aloft for times which are of the order of even one hour or couple of hours. The only problem in keeping it uh, aloft was that the, the plane was going too far and therefore the, the, it was getting lost. We lost a few of them because it was going too far and we couldn't recall it back by radio control. The trajectories are, as, I, as I've shown you before, they're, they're, they're very similar to the spirals that you've seen before done by the wing, uh, by, the, by, the, um, by the birds. And here is another trajectory, as you see at the beginning, it's going down, then it's picking up this, uh, this uh, thermal here, and again, it's spiraling and it's reaching heights of the order of a few hundred uh, meters. So the, 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 this is work. How much time do I have, uh, Roberto? I think I'm done, right? I would say yes, more or less, but please uh, okay. go on. I mean, uh, well, I'm more or less done. So I, I, you know, the 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 only thing I would like to say this is worth. Then there's uh, there's more recent stuff which we've been doing, in particular uh, work on trail tracking, which just came out in uh, PNAS. Uh, again, this is based on uh, uh, this is trying to uh, to to refresh a little bit the field. The field so far has been that essentially these animals are doing uh, chemotaxis, which means that whenever they cross the trail, what they do is that they sense the ascending, uh, they sense the, the 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 more concentration as they cross in this direction. Then when they go and they pass the the the, the trail, then they're gonna sense that this is going down, and this very simple mechanism of gradients, ascent and descent, then when they feel that that is going down, they, they turn and that's the way they do their trail tracking. 
Now, this maybe it's it's giving a contribution to to all this, but we are not quite convinced that this is the end of the story and that the animals are just like bacteria. Um, so we we propose a different theory, a different theory which is based on uh, animals that have a much more uh, 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 more memory and in particular they can remember their past detections like in this case here therefore what they do when they remember for example these two past detections is that they can create a cone a possible cone where the trail is going to be located which is based on the most likely path which is the straight line which is here or here and then the cone is going to give you the uncertainty the estimated uncertainty now this is giving you quite different uh, predictions than what you could get by the chemotactic mechanism that I was uh, presenting before. Um, so I, if, you, if you're interested, you can, you, you can read the paper here. We use again reinforcement learning in order to extract the, the, cast, the, the casting behavior in the absence of the, of the, path, of the trail, because of, because of course the chemotactic mechanism a priori is gonna completely fail whenever the, uh, the trail is absent because because there's no there's no gradient that you can climb anymore and the animal seems to be smarter than that they're still able to uh, to do casting in the absence of the trail therefore we are pretty confident that at least some of the what we are uh, proposing might might have some relevance and then uh, the last thing is the some work which is still unpublished is just on the archive which on the olfactory searches uh, tries to explain the phenomenon that I'm sure you, you're all familiar with, the fact that dogs, while they are uh, tracking the trace, they alternate between sniffing on the ground and then from time to time they even stand on their legs or they just raise their head and they, uh, they sniff in the air. And what we do together with Agnese Seminaria, Nicola Rigolli and Gautam Reddy is to try and explain this phenomenon. And with the way we understand it is that at long distances, if you look at the, uh, at the detections at the ground and up in the air, uh, the, at the ground they are much more localized. So they, they are smoother, as you can see here, but they reach much uh, less distance. While in the air you have more noise, but they go farther away. And therefore, if you're far away and you're losing, you don't smell enough on the ground, it's advantageous to stop because while you, you're smelling in the air, you move more slowly, but it's more advantageous to pay this price of moving more slowly or stopping, but having some detections. And therefore you have an alternation. And again, we use machine learning in order to uh, figure out when it's convenient to, to alternate and when you should switch from one one uh, 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 modality of, of sensing from to another one. And with this, I'm done. These are uh, the different people I had the pleasure of working with over the years. And I thank you so much for uh, and support, of course, is indicated uh, here. And it's a mixture of France and the United States, depending on where I was. And I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Massimo. It's really very nice seminar. And uh, OK, I think that there is space for questions. Nobody's. Can I ask a question, this is Luca? Yes. Oh, oh Massimo. And uh, Hill, please, uh, Luca. No, I mean, I don't know if there is somebody first. Come on, uh, come book on. Okay, uh, ciao Massimo, thank you for the seminar. It was great, as usual. Um, I, I, I want to have a question about the gliding. Mm -hmm. uh, did you, can you use a baseline to help the system to learn quicker? I mean, by using your knowledge of fluid dynamics, uh, that is non-zero, non, non of course. So it's, uh, can, you, can you, I don't know, put the, the final reward, which is uh, positive only if it, it goes and it does something that is better than what you would do just on the basis of your knowledge? Yes. You can, you, 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 you can of course combine. So the, the way we approached the problem was to really take a, um, you know, you're saying the knowledge is non-zero. Yes, the knowledge is non-zero, but, uh, you know, once you go in the, once you go in the desert, uh, I'm not sure it's so much more than non-zero. So to start with, we decided to go very empirical and to just 
trust the data and to go empirically and to learn from the experience. Now, um, of course, you can use uh, some knowledge and you can combine uh, control theory with reinforcement learning and give a baseline. And I think in cases where you you trust, you, you can trust your knowledge, I think this is clearly going to be more advantageous. The surprise that we had uh, a posteriori, because at the beginning, that's not what I was expecting, is that in fact the training is not very long. So in a couple of days we were able to train the gliders. So in uh, in deciding what kind of of strategy you want to use, I think you should um, you should consider all these different aspects. Uh, certainly you can include some prior information and use some more control than just pure reinforcement learning. Um, and make a balance of what is advantageous or not advantageous, how much you trust what you know, how much the, uh, the, the agent has to go in an environment that you don't control. Because one thing also is that the, over the days, the turbulence is not steady at all. So you could, in fact, input some information and you should be careful because one thing that you certainly shouldn't do, one thing which also happened with the olfactory researchers, is that if you uh, if you input some information which is wrong, uh, that's very deleterious. For example, if you tell the agent, the sniffer, that the wind is blowing in a certain direction and is blowing in an opposite direction, the sniffer is going gonna, is gonna to suffer. So that's the answer. Achille already wanted to raise a question. Yes, thank you, Massimo. Thank you. It was very nice. So maybe this is far fetching, but I was wondering whether, uh, you know, suppose that you go macroscopically, uh, you know, whether you can, you know, apply this strategy at, uh, you know, to, 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 to engineer these uh, this, uh, nanoscale robots in which they can sort of. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, you know, that uh, can be driven to follow a given track for drug delivery, for example, applications. Yes. yes, absolutely, yes. And in fact, I've been talking about soaring, but there's been, uh, by the way, Luca has been working on, on this, on micro swimmers, um, not nano, but micro swimmers, where you, you, can, uh, you can absolutely, you can use these reinforcement learning uh, uh, tools in order to make them uh, do things for example, you can have them keep a certain height. Uh, this is an, an application for if you want to keep the boys or you're going to keep the animals at the, at the given at the given depth, or you can have them go and use the structures in a, in a turbulent flow in order to go to some particular at some particular location. Luca in particular was working on the Zermelo problem, which is to go from place A to place B in the shortest possible time. And of course, the difficulty is that in the middle you have a turbulent flow, which is going to bring you wherever it wants, and so you have to cope with this. And you can you can use reinforcement learning in order to do this kind of things. So the answer is yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. As far as I can see, there is another question raised by Robin Hannon. Please. Uh, hi, Massimo. Um, hi. I had another question about the uh, the gliders. So. Mm -hmm. So you train this relatively simple policy, and I'm wondering if I mean you look you you showed it on a picture, and it looks like it has some structure. I'm wondering if a posteriori you can you can uh, interpret it or kind of understand at some level what the uh, the glider is doing. Yes, uh, in fact, the, the that's that was the thing that um, so it's this one here that you can see. Um, so you see what's happening. What is happening is that if the um, so negative acceleration and negative torque, essentially that's not a good place. <laughs> that's not a good place to be. Clearly, because vertical acceleration it means that you are in a down draft. Therefore, what the policy is telling you to do is what every glider pilot is is uh, will would tell you to do. Just get out of there. And to get out of there, uh, pick up the maximum bank angle that you can possibly have. So just get away of there and fly away. Now, as the signal gets less uh, uh, strong, like in this case here, okay. So you can see that that it's pointing out ten, peak minus ten here, and then on the other side you get in the good situation, 
in the good situation here, it's telling you to keep the, the bank angle relatively small. So the blue arrows, they are telling you to reduce the bank angle and to stay where you are. So both of them are pointing to a relatively small bank angle here. And um, this situation is when you have the turbulence level. So the level of fluctuations compared to the typical mean wind is relatively, uh, uh, the RMS is low, meaning the fluctuations are relatively weak. In the case where the fluctuations are getting higher, uh, when you compare these two, uh, you can see that there are some differences. And these differences are essentially that uh, uh, you should trust uh, less the signal that is coming from the environment. So in other words, all this is we recover, we recover relatively common sense that you would uh, that you would use into this with one advantage with respect to the glider pilots that the glider pilots usually they use the acceleration as they say they 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 drive with the butt because whenever they they get kicked so they 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 do something in response to the acceleration they usually are not able to use the torque and the torque actually we show here that it's quite important so if we compare the policies of a a, a, a world champion uh, Reichmann, uh, his name, uh, he developed a, a policy of flight based entirely on the acceleration. If we compare our policy here with the Reichmann uh, policy, we, we fly with one of the two. In fact, our own policy, which includes also the torque, turns out to be more efficient than the Reichmann one. So if you want, if you with the acceleration, we recover Reichmann. And then with the torque, we are able to improve onto that. And it's, I would say, as I said, it's, 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 it's quite common sense. So the advantage of the lookup table is that you, you can make sense of the, of the policy, yes. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions? I don't see anybody else. Raising their hands for a question is not necessarily obviously to raise your hand, but um, okay. So, if there's anybody else, let me thank again Massimo for his very nice and very interesting seminar. It was really illuminating, at least I, I learned a lot of things, and uh, I'm very happy for that. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you all. Thank you, Massimo. Thank, thank you, you Massimo. to everyone. Bye, everyone. Hope to see you. Bye. 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 Bye.